Hello, this is Jack Jackson. In this video, we're going to be talking a little bit about the uh, search for and eventual finding of solutions of cubic and quartic polynomial equations. This is a rather fascinating story, actually. Um, so as Europe um, became more uh, used to hinder Arabic numerals, they became more used to uh, the algebra that was developed in first in um, the uh, the Muslim world, uh, and then also then uh, in late Renaissance or late uh, medieval period. In the Renaissance, we had a general interest in algebra really picking up, and in particular, we were looking at solving cubic and quartic polynomial equations. Now, to set the stage for what I want to talk about, I want to talk a little bit about mathematician employment and competition in the Renaissance a little bit. Now today, most research mathematicians who are creating new mathematics are employed by universities. Some others are employed by governments such as the uh, National Security uh, Administration, NSA in the United States, and by some businesses, but the biggest group of them are employed by universities. Um, now this is different than say, just folks who are employed to teach mathematics at uh, public schools, K-12 schools, private schools, and then also uh, people who are, who are primarily teaching at universities and colleges, community colleges and so forth. The, the folks that are really creating the, the new mathematics are research mathematicians at uh, you know, tier one mathematics uh, uh, research institutions. And their main job really is to create new mathematics, uh, even though they may be doing some teaching as well. And the academic structure is set up to reward publication of results. So job security, tenure, promotion, and marketability for other jobs depend largely on publishing new mathematics for folks at that level. So mathematics advances are shared with the world via research journals. And not to say that there's uh, not any competition, because there is, but the competition is more about who can get their results published first to be the first one to claim that they figured something out and then share it with the world. No one gets paid uh, directly uh, for publishing in a, in a research journal, but they're rewarded indirectly through job security, tenure, promotion, and so forth. So there's definitely some incentive there to share your work. And of course, because of that, uh, mathematics and other areas grows uh, very a lot more rapidly because ideas are shared and people build upon the works of other folks. Now, in the Renaissance, there's a very different situation. Certainly, many of the great European universities have been founded. Many of them have been around for, for at least two or three centuries. And they, they definitely employed mathematicians. So that part's kind of the same. But mathematical journals and the culture of rapid publication results had not yet been established. There was no tenure. There was, no, <clears throat> there was very little job security. So knowing something that others did not know was actually an advantage, and there were far fewer incentives to publish and share that knowledge right away. There were even some public competitions made to display mathematical skill. Each contestant would challenge their opponents to work a set of difficult problems which they knew how to solve. Hopefully, they could solve their opponent's problems as well and establish themselves as a stronger mathematician, which would lead to keeping their job or being promoted to their job or, or perhaps give, getting a, a better position somewhere. Winners were rewarded and losers could even lose their jobs. So notice it was a much more competitive environment. It's not as good for general mathematical growth. It's in this competitive environment that an interesting story of the development of algebra took place. Now we talk about polynomial equations. Some solutions to polynomial equations go back to really to prehistory. Linear equations are very simple and many ancient mathematicians could solve linear equations and use them to solve applications. Certainly ancient Babylonians, Indians, Chinese, Egyptians, and others 
all solve problems of these types, even though, of course, they did not use modern notation. Typically, negative solutions were not considered legitimate, at least until the early modern period, actually later than the, than the, than the early Renaissance. Simple linear formula could be used during using modern notation. So if you have mx plus b equals 0, where m and b are constants, you can easily solve for x is minus b over m. So a very simple linear formula. Now what about quadratic equations, second degree polynomial equations? Well, solving problems equivalent to solving quadratic equations also goes way back to ancient cultures. These listed above, we know, for example, that the ancient Babylonians, the earliest of these cultures, actually solved problems that are equivalent to using quadratic equations and finding solutions. So at least in certain cases, the uh, quadratic solutions were known way, way back. But again, non-real and negative solutions and coefficients were not considered uh, legitimate for a long time. So quadratic equations were studied in different forms, whereas today we would consider all quadratic equations having a sim sim uh, simple form like, like this, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. We would say, today we would say those are all just quadratic form, quadratic uh, type equations and they were all have essentially the same kind of a solution. Uh, Al Khwarizmi used his algebraic methods along with some geometric proofs to systematically study quadratic equations. He divided them into at least six types. Uh, for example, he would consider x squared plus bx equals c and x squared plus c equals bx were two different forms because he's insisting on the b and c being positive numbers. And that's you know two of the six types there. Again, today we would consider ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero for a, b, and c being any real numbers as being a legitimate quadratic equation. And we know by completing the square, we can algebraically derive and prove the quadratic formula, which is x equals the opposite of b over 2a plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. We consider this one form and we consider negative and even non-real complex number solutions as legitimate in theory and in some applications. While negative and non-real solutions were not usually allowed, quadratic equations solution methods were well known at the start of the Renaissance period. Now what about polynomial equations of degree 3 or 4 or 5 or higher, right? Well, some progress on solving some polynomial equations of degree three had been made by earlier cultures, including the Chinese and the Arabs. Some approximation methods were found and geometric constructions for some cases were known. So the geometric and algebraic methods, but no really general solution had been known up to this point. And so that became a, an interesting search for mathematicians. And so they were searching for a general algebraic method to solving cubic and quartic equations, and that became a topic of much interest in Renaissance Europe. Now this sets the stage for an interesting story of discovery, competition, and bitter, bitter rivalry in 16th century Europe. And we, on the one hand, we've got Tartaglia, and on the other hand, we've got Cardano. And here we have a big... Um, conflict between these two uh, mathematicians. So let's, uh, let's, let's follow the history of this just a little bit. So let's go back a little bit before this to Luca uh, Pacioli. He lived from 1445 to 1517 in San Sepulcro in uh, present-day Italy. In 1494, he wrote a book called Summa, which gives a summary account of all the mathematics known to date. So this was kind of like a, an encyclopedic type of, um, um, you know, mathematical text, like a, a textbook that collected a lot of what was known to Europeans at that time. So this is going to include uh, various branches of mathematics, include a lot of what was known about algebra and, of course, uh, Hindu Arabic numerals and so forth. He taught mathematics at the court in Milan of Sforza. 
Okay, so notice he was employed by a, uh, you know, someone, an, an aristocrat there. And so that's one of the ways um, mathematicians were employed at the time. He was a good enough mathematician that he ended up working with uh, Leonardo da Vinci in Milan. Uh, he wrote a book called Divinia Proportione, or the, the Divine Proportion. And uh, da Vinci uh, illustrated the book with, his, with figures. He wrote some preliminary investigations into solving cubic equations, but uh, wasn't able to get very far. He did some work with square roots. Uh, he at, tried to analyze a game of chance, one of the first people to do that. Unfortunately, his analysis was a, a bit incorrect, so this sort of predates probability theory, which came a little bit later. He did some early work with number theory and magic squares. He visited Bologna in 1501 to 1502, and there he worked with Scipione de Ferro. Perhaps they studied cubic equations a little bit there, but Pacioli stated that general solutions to cubic equations by algebraic means were going to be impossible. So that brings us to Del Ferro. He was born February 6, 1465 and died November 5, 1526. He lived in the Bologna and the Papal States. That's part of uh, present-day Italy that was controlled by the Vatican, by the, by the church. Um, in addition to being a mathematician, he was a paper maker and a businessman. From 1496 until his death in 1526, he was lecturer in mathematics at the University of Bologna. Now, the University of Bologna had been around quite a while. It was founded in the 11th century, and at this point now it's basically the 16th century, early 16th century. Unfortunately, none of his uh, original writings have survived. It would be really good to see one in particular I want to mention to you here in a second. So it turns out he was the first one that we know of to find a general algebraic solution method to a class of cubic polynomial equations. The ones he was looking at was x cubed plus cx equals d, where c and d are positive constants. Now it turns out that through some clever substitutions, all poly cubic polynomial equations can be reduced to this form. So really finding this solution along with a few other things, really is the critical step for solving all cubic polynomial questions, but probably Faro didn't know this. Certainly, he thought of different forms to avoid negative coefficients and negative solutions. But here's the thing. He didn't publish his work. He guarded it, his uh, discoveries pretty closely, and he only shared them with a few friends and students. He did write out a detailed solution in a notebook. And when he died, his son-in-law, Hannibal Knave, inherited that. Now, Knave was also a mathematician. He ended up actually taking Pharaoh's position at the university in Bologna upon Pharaoh's death. Unfortunately, this notebook does not survive. It'd be cool to have it if it did. He did some other work. He worked on rationalizing fractional denominators. He worked on uh, trying to determine which geometrical problems could be solved with a compass set in a fixed position. On his deathbed, Farrell passed his secret solution to these cubic equations to his student, Fior. Now, we're going to talk about another prominent mathematician, Niccolo Fontana Tartaglia. He was born in 1500 and died in December 13, 1557. He lived in the Republic of Venice, which is part of present-day Italy. Now, he, uh, this particular area of Italy, um, if you look at a, well, let's just look back at a map real fast. Okay, so, so uh, here's Venice here, right? And so we're talking about this area here. Well, we had French invaders, German invaders, people from the south. There was a lot of conflict in this area, okay? And in particular, he uh, got involved with some French, inv uh, a conflict with French invaders in 1512, so at the age of 12, and he got wounded pretty seriously with a sword wound 
uh, into the face and almost killed him. And it left him with very much of a difficulty speaking. So he ended up taking the nickname Tartaglia, which means the stammerer. And so now he's known uh, more by his name Tartaglia than his given name, Niccolo Fontana. And he always wore a beard to, to cover his scars. Now you see a, a, a bust of him there. Earlier we saw a picture of him here. Artist rendering. There's Cardano. We'll get to him in a minute. Now, what are some things that he did? Well, in 1537, he wrote a book called Nova Scientitia, uh, applying mathematics to artillery fire. He was the first uh, one to give firing tables. He wrote a popular arithmetic text. He was the first to translate Euclid's elements to Italian. And he published Latin editions of some of the works of Archimedes. Now, Fior boasted that he knew how to solve cubic equations, remember? Del Ferro told him that on his deathbed how to do it. And he had learned to solve one type from Del Ferro. That was the type of x cubed plus cx equals d. Remember, we're thinking of various different types based on making sure that the coefficients were positive. And, of course, they're only really considering positive solutions. So ultimately what happened was in 1535, there became a challenge between Fior and Tartaglia was arranged. Now Fior was confident that nobody else could solve these types of equations. So he submitted 30 questions and they were all pretty much about solving this type of cubic equation. Now Tartaglia for his 30 questions submitted a variety of problems and eventually he exposed Fior's mediocre mathematical ability. Now, Tartaglia had to solve a different type of cubic equation, a one that looked like x cubed plus bx squared equals d, where b and d are constants. Now, of course, they wouldn't have written them this way. This is modern notation. And it turns out that just days before the contest, Tartaglia had a uh, revelation, and he discovered how to solve Fior's case as well. So now he could solve all of Fior's stuff, but Fior had serious problems with Tartaglia's. So Tartaglia ended up solving all 30 of Fior's problems in under two hours, but Fior could not solve many of Tartaglia's problems. So he exposed Fior as being somewhat mediocre. Tartaglia was the clear winner and the champion of solving cubic equations at this point in history. And this led to his contact with Cardano. Here's another picture of Cardano, another drawing. Now, Girolamo Cardano was born September 24, 1501, and died September 21, 1576. He lived in, lived in Pavia, which is part of the Duchy, uh, Duchy of Milan, this part of present-day Italy. So all of these guys that we're talking about are Italians of some version. Now, you may see his name written other ways. In English, He'll be often referred to as Jerome Cardan. So uh, in English um, text and so forth, you'll very often hear him just referred to as Cardan instead of Cardano. In Latin, it was Hieronym Hieronymus Cardanus. His father was a lawyer and mathematician who actually advised Leonardo da Vinci. So he got some early training from his father. His father wanted him to go into law as well, uh, but Cardano uh, eventually was convinced his dad or whatever to let him study medicine. He ended up get up getting a doctorate in medicine in 1525 and actually made some uh, name for himself uh, curing some folks, uh, curing some, uh, you know, royalty. But he was kind of an interesting and difficult man to be around. Um, he was gambler at different periods in his life. He, he mainly spent all his time playing games of chance and, and playing chess and gambling. He made use of his knowledge of some probability to help him gain an upper hand there. And he generally probably won more than he lost. But still, that's a tough life to be around. And he had difficulty keeping jobs, although he did have some good mathematical type jobs along the way. All right, so now let's go back to Tartaglia. In 1535, remember that was the year that 
Tartaglia trounced uh, Fior in the, in the challenge, Cardano heard about this and was interested and was trying to work on solving some of these equations himself, but he had not made as much progress. So he approached Tartaglia and started requesting that he tell, uh, let him know about his method of solving these cubic equations. And he said, I will publish it, but I'll give you credit to, to you, Tartaglia, and Tartaglia at first. And then, no way. And eventually, after some, some time, he relented. And he says, okay, I'll give this to you, but only if you swear you will not publish it. I want to publish it in my own book. And Cardano agreed to that, swore an oath that he would not do that. Well, Cardano had a student, Ferrari, which I'll talk about a little bit on the next slide. And they, together, the two of them, intensely studied Tartaglia's method of solving cubic equations. And not only were they able to understand it, they could work it out and see how to extend it to solve any form of cubic equation. Okay, and Ferrari even went a little bit further, we'll talk about it in a minute. Cardano and Ferrari then visited Florence in 1543. And guess what? They were shown a copy, or not a copy, they were shown the actual notebook of Del Ferro uh, by his son Nave. Well, they saw that Del Ferro had actually worked out all the critical pieces of solving cubic equations before Tartaglia ever did. Now, meanwhile, Tartaglia is dragging his feet on getting things published. So Cardano thinks this way. He says, hey, wait a minute. Tartaglia showed me a solution, but really, it, here's another solution. This is the same solution, but it's found much earlier by Del Ferro, and he justified that he could publish that solution uh, and said he wasn't publishing Tartaglia's solution. He was publishing uh, Ferro's solution. And so he did that in a very influential work called Ars Magna. That would be translated as the, the Majestic Arts. And so this is the first Latin treatise devoted solely to algebra. So a, a strictly algebra textbook in Latin. And in this, he did give appropriate credit to not only Del Ferro, but Tartagli, Tartaglia and his student Ferrari. So he, did, he wasn't claiming these things of his own. But he, uh, again, he rationalized that he was not publishing the solution of Tartaglia, but rather publishing the earlier method of Del Ferro and the subsequent work of himself and Ferrari. So he is, in his mind, he wasn't breaking his oath to Tartaglia. Of course, Tartaglia did not see it this way. We'll come back to that in just a minute. In this slide, I want to talk about um, Ferrari, Lodovicio Ferrari. He was born February 2nd, 1522, and died October 5th, 1565. He lived in Bologna in the Papal States, present-day Italy. Now, at age 14, he ended up uh, going into the employ of Cardano, who quickly saw that he had some education and skills, made him his secretary, and then a mathematics student his. Eventually, Cardano resigned his post at the Piatti Foundation as a math instructor in Milan. In uh, 1541, and really he did that to make room for Ferrari to take that position. Ferrari had some competition from a mathematician named Coy, and he was able to defeat him and take that position. Ferrari helped Cardano use the methods that they learned from Tartaglia and from Del Ferro's notebooks to solve all cubic equations. But not only that, he went further. He was the first to be able to solve all quartic equations as well. So he was able to discover a technique that would reduce the problem to solving a cubic equation, which he had already mastered. And Ferrari's solution to, to quartic equations was also published in that same work, Ars Magna, by Cardano. So Ferrari and Cardano were the first to work uh, also with non-real complex numbers, even though they didn't really fully understand them. And uh, sort of to add insult to injury, this is the formula that Cardan or Cardano uh, published for solving this x cubed plus cx plus uh, equals d. 
it's equivalent to um, the method of Tartaglia, but is often known as the Cadan formula, uh, even though Tartaglia came up with it first, or perhaps maybe Del Ferro came up with it before him as well. So now we've got a serious conflict, because guess what? This thing is in public, in print. This book has become very popular. It's very important and influential book. And Tartaglia is ticked off. He was furious with Cardano for breaking his oath. And he ch repeatedly challenged Cardano to a contest. Cardano resisted. Uh, Tartaglia did not want to challenge Ferrari because Ferrari at that point was a relatively unknown. If he beat this relatively unknown, it wasn't going to gain him a lot. He really wanted his revenge on Cardano. But he did start uh, corresponding with Ferrari, trying to uh, you know, goad Cardano into a um, competition. So they co corresponded for over a year, exchanging ever-growing personal insults. And this correspondence was in the form of open letters, so it wasn't just between the two of them. This this uh, debate and and fight was out in the public. In 1548, Tartaglia was given a good position in his hometown of Brescia, and they wanted him to settle this thing once and for all. And so now he was sort of forced to go ahead and... Uh, have a competition with Ferrari, okay? And so, um, you know, he thought he was up to the task, so they, they decided to have this competition. It happened on August 10th, 1548. And so he would traveled to Milan and enter a contest with Ferrari. And Ferrari ended up winning the competition. He, uh, he just had a, they both had a pretty good understanding of at least that one class of cubics, but Ferrari had a better understanding of cubics in general. And, of course, Ferrari had a better understanding of the quartic equations and so forth. And so although Tartaglia was a, was a great mathematician, he, he ended up losing, and he suffered for it. Uh, he was he was been working for almost a year at Brescia, and he was not really paid the wages that he was promised after this loss. And he sued them and just never rec recovered from that. Ferrari ended up was rewarded. He was offered multiple positions. He ended up taking one that made him the most money as a tax assessor to the governor of Milan. Ferrari retired young, had some money, and was able to retire young. But unfortunately, his widowed sister uh, perhaps poisoned him, uh, killing him at a young age. And... Um, she did this to inherit his money. So she inherited his money and then got married shortly after that. So uh, perhaps she, she poisoned him. That's not 100% sure. Now, it's unfortunate that they did not have a culture of sharing accomplishments and publishing results. Because if they did, this unfortunate situation could have been avoided. Progress could have been made more quickly. Tartaglia could have published his works first or perhaps even... even uh, uh, Del Ferro could have published his, his work earlier on. Tartaglia, Cardano, Ferrari could have built on each other's works and that this whole thing would have been made more prog progress a lot earlier and there wouldn't be in all these problems. I want to mention one more mathematician in this video before we move on to the next one and that is Raphael Bombelli. He was born January of 1526 and died in 1572. Uh, he also lived in Bologna, the Papal States. Now, he's a little younger than these others that we looked at, uh, at least younger than Cardano. And he studied Ars Magna of Cardano and followed the conflict with Tartaglia and Cardano and Tartaglia and uh, Ferrari. He was, among other things, a hydraulic engineer. He was hired by the, the, uh, the Vatican to drain some swampy land and come up with a way to take care of that. And one of the things that he also did is he uh, translated Diophantus uh, Arithmetica, and from that he found a lot of really interesting algebra problems there as well. And so he decided to write an influential algebra book, and 
unlike uh, Cardano's work, for example, Cardano's work was set to be, uh, you know, to, it was aimed at other mathematicians, at the top level mathematicians to explain his method and so forth. But it wasn't really aimed at the masses. So Bombelli's book was much more aimed at the masses, much more like a, you know, like a modern day college algebra book or, or algebra one or algebra two textbook where it's, it's aimed at teaching, you know, so sort of the general public how to do some algebra. He intended to publish the algebra text in five volumes. He ended up publishing the first three in uh, 1572. And if you notice, that's the year he died. So he died before getting the last two published. He introduced more symbolism in there. That was a general trend during the Renaissance to move towards more symbolism. And Bombelli was one of the ones that helped push that forward. His text was easier to follow than earlier texts and papers, such as Cardano's Ars Magna. He gave, among other things, he gave rules for performing operations on negative numbers. Now, remember, there were some folks in, in, in uh, India that had done that quite a bit earlier, but this is the first real treatment of that in Europe. He was also the first ever to give a good treatment of complex numbers to see how to take complex numbers and how you could do basic operations with them, abstract, multiply, and divide, and so forth. He showed that quadratic equations that were thought to not have solution had solutions, perhaps negative solutions or perhaps complex number solutions. And so he basically was able to show that all quadratic equations had solutions if you're allowed to look into the complex number system. Now think of this, this is way ahead of his time in a way because all of this was at a time when most mathematicians didn't even accept negative numbers, much less complex numbers as being legitimate. So he was quite ahead of his time, and but by the time that he published his textbook, uh, we had a textbook available in Europe for doing algebra that was accessible to uh, lots of folks. And so that gave a, a good source of educational material that could be taught in, uh, you know, in schools and colleges and so forth. And, um, you know, budding mathematicians could learn from his text before they moved on to some more advanced, more research type mathematics. So interesting story uh, in the Renaissance. We, uh, not without some conflict, but we have now uh, cubic and quartic equations. One final thing is kind of interesting, and we'll talk about this later on. But, uh, you know, we we now have, there is a, a uh, you know, linear formula, quadratic formula. There is a cubic formula. Showed you part of it earlier. A quartic formula, which I haven't shown you yet. But those those things exist. It turns out, well, what about a fifth degree polynomial formula or a sixth degree or seventh degree? Wouldn't that be the, the topic for further uh, research? And it was a topic for further research. But as it turns out, it's actually impossible to take a general fifth degree polynomial equation or six degree or seventh degree or any higher degree and solve it in general okay we can't solve all of those so even though we may know that they have some solutions we have approximation techniques there's no necessary uh, way to do that and it's not because just somebody has never come up with it we've actually proved that it is impossible for there to ever be a solution but that proof was going to have to wait for the invention of abstract algebra several centuries further in the future from where we are in the Renaissance.